<laughs> is it time for recess yet? I'm so glad you found time to join us here on the Child Care Director's Chair, where Erica Sococcio shares her best practices that she's refined through her passion of directing child care centers over the last 23 years. From parenting interaction, systems to save you time, money, and stress, to profitability. She shares it all from the Child Care Director's Chair. Hey guys, it's Erica Sakosho here with the Child Care Director's Chair podcast. I'm so excited you tuned in today. I have a very dear friend of mine um, on our show, Julie Anderson, aka The Brain Lady. Um, she, um, or I should say, I was a co author in the book that she spearheaded um, that I, we talk about a little bit on our show, Women Excelling Everywhere. So, welcome to the show, Julie. Oh, thank you for having me here. I'm so looking forward to this conversation. Me too. Um, so tell folks just a little bit about your background. Okay. I am um, known as the Brain Lady or Brain Lady Julie. I kind of got that term because, quite frankly, I'm a little bit of a brain geek. Um, I am was born and raised in Northern California. I am the proud parent of three grown children, all boys. They are now in their 30s, so they are, are grown and living their own magnificent life. And uh, I have four sisters, all girls. So I had boys, but all sisters. And um, yeah, in my late 30s or my late 20s, I just started studying and fell in love with the brain and went down a brain rabbit hole that has brought me to where I'm at now. So that's that's the, the capsule. <laughs> you can ask me if you want more deets. Sure. <laughs> okay. So that's the reason I asked you on this show, because I wanted to talk a little bit about mindfulness and emotional intelligence when it comes to leadership and early childhood education. So I thought today we could dive into the connection between mindfulness, emotional intelligence, and leadership, and how mindfulness can help you regulate your emotions, empathize with others, and inspire trust and loyalty among your team. So I really thought that this was something important to talk about on the show. We talk about a lot of the business mechanics of it, but you need the personality and the skill set to implement those business mechanics, especially in a leadership role, right? You can't be like bull and, you know, try to lead everybody by the horns, but you also can't be wishy-washy like a mop. So it's kind of that culmination of the two. Um, So I thought we could just dig a little bit deeper into the brain development and the thinking behind it and how it all works. So that's why we called you. Before we do that, I love, I love, love, love to give shout outs to my listeners. I am so grateful, Julia. She's a fellow podcaster. I cannot tell you how amazing our listeners are. Our show has has tripled in listeners in less than 30 days. Like it's insane. So um, I want to give a shout out to our listeners in Michigan, Arizona, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Rhode Island, California, New York. There's so many of you. Um, We thank you. We are humbly grateful. And then to Miss Haja, thank you so much for supporting our show and Megan Gallagher, who were our very first two official sponsors or membership uh, folks in our show. So if you want to support our podcast and you love our content, please click the link below. There is an option that's as low as $3 a month to support our podcast that help us continue to produce wonderful, amazing free content to all of you. So uh, that's my housekeeping for the day. So thank you for staying with us. Um, So Julie, let's get into it. Can we talk a little bit about what are some common challenging behaviors in children? Why may they occur? And how do folks that are in the field help with, you know, empathy and and, and be supportive of their staff? Because, you know, kids are having a lot of challenges now and they need that leadership that can help not only the children, but the teachers cope through, you know, the day to day. Yeah. Absolutely. So we all know that there's a couple of things at play here. One is kids aren't playing with a full deck. Like, let's just face it. They yeah. they are where they're at. They're in development. They're learning, especially in early childhood, they're learning their place in the world, right? So they have to, through the experience of day-to-day life, they kind of figure out the social things that they need to figure out to be and to grow. And Sadly, for the world as a whole, the last five years have been horrible, right? It, everybody's still, the, the, there's just this, the entire mindset of individuals 
has shifted so much in her life. Dramatic, yeah. Dramatically. And the, the thing for our little kids is they've experienced too, but they have no way to articulate it. They have no way to explain their feelings. They have no way to understand um, what is happening. They just don't have the brain power for that yet. That portion of the brain isn't completely developed. It hasn't even begun, really. Yeah. <laughs> Deeply to develop when you're talking early childhood. So for our little kids, what that results in is behavioral issues. Because they can't articulate and because they don't really understand what's going on, they don't know why their life, their schedule, their um, normal th normalcy was so upset and then they watch the emotional upsets of their parents and all the adults and the adults are supposed to have it all together and we didn't know what the blank was going on <laughs> yeah so in these little brains they just didn't they just couldn't process it so we see that coming out in those challenging behaviors yeah whether it's you know temper tantrums or or hitting or biting or you know or isolation and yeah. that's what we begin to see that's what's behind it yeah, and that so I think that's why having strong leadership because the the teachers need your help. So having strong leadership really is important, and it makes me think about benefit early childhood leaders in the decision making process. You know, I am such a huge advocate of mindfulness pr practice. There's just like almost n I have not yet to find anything that it doesn't help with because when you do the mindfulness practice and when you you really do that on a day to day basis and you incorporate it into your life, then you have so much more control over your higher thinking. Yeah. Right. You can access that so much uh, like on a dime. Whereas if you if you're not practicing that on a regular basis, then the emotion brain takes over. Yeah. And when the emotion brain takes over, now you've got two kids in the classroom, right? Yeah. <laughs> it just, it brings me back to when I went to Arizona and I really learned so much about mindfulness and how to use it myself in my own life as a multi-location childcare owner. It was life-changing for me. And it not only was it life-changing for me, it was life-changing for the people around me. Because when I came back, I was different and I'm yes. still different. And it's hard for them because they were so used to me being a certain way. And now I I feel like I am very grateful for the things in my life, but I also have put up some boundaries and said, you know what, my self-care is really important because for me to be able to continue to give and give and give, I need to replenish. And so I think that that's something that's really important when we think about mindfulness and it doesn't take a lot of time and you don't have to change your whole life. Like I felt like this morning, one of the things I absolutely will not do anymore is I will not leave my, I need to do my morning meditation. Even if it's five minutes, I know literally, I know it sounds hokey. It is life changing because you know, the phone would ring and what teacher called out and you're running out, I'm running out of the house. You forgot your back, your lunch, you didn't get your, like it's life changing. And if it's like changing for someone like me who's 53 and very set in my ways, you know, just this little bit to teach someone who's only been on the earth three years, five years is impactful. And then even the younger generation, if you've only been a director a couple of years, this practice really can help you during the stressful times, right? So if somebody like an old dog like me can learn the new trick, you can too, listeners out there. I think, you know, and it's a practice, right? It is a practice. It's hard to clear your mind, right? Um, I, I had a teacher we were just talking about the other day and she's like, oh, I tried it. It didn't work. I tried meditation. It didn't work. It's so hot. All these things kept coming to my head. I'm like, that's why it's a practice because it's hard, right? Your brain's a muscle. It's hard to clear your mind and just focus on the one thing. And um, But it's it's so beneficial. So beneficial. Very much so. And the, the key is, is as you're, and you don't, some people think that you have to do the, the, Completely clear your mind, wipe it out. You just go into this zone state. Mindfulness meditation does not have to go to that, right? You can get really good results from harnessing and hyper-focusing your thoughts, right? So when you're doing this, you are becoming 100% in the now, 100% present. And that's the key because you're training your brain to do that in an instant. 
So for me, my mornings are that that very, you know, just feet on the ground, feeling every sensation in my body, looking, opening my eyes, looking at the colors of the leaves. Are they moving the wind? What's the temperature of the skin? Becoming 100% present. What that does is it so activates the higher regions of your brain and you learn to do it so quickly that now when a stressful moment hits you in the face in the middle of the day, the screaming child, the unhappy parent, the, um, you know, the, the teacher that just lost it, you know, and is crying. Now you can just in one breath, literally in one breath in out, out through your nose, because that activates the brain. Now your brain knows that signal. You've trained it that signal because you're doing the mindfulness practice every day. And it instantly is in a higher thinking. Yeah. So now you're controlling the narrative as opposed to letting that situation control you. And it's funny how you say that too, because even with the brain, so there's this, there's this eucalyptus spray that I purchased off my niece. Well, it's a spa and I love it. And anytime I, I smell it, I instantly go, oh my God, it just takes me to a happy place. I have a small bottle of it in my office. And sometimes I'll be like, okay, let me just, I need a, I need a minute. And again, it sounds so silly, but I have trained my brain. As soon as I smell that, I am instantly calmer. Literally instantly went, okay, you got this, right? Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's, you know, certainly very important. So it, let's think about... How mindfulness and leadership contributes to creating a positive and nurturing environment for young children and the staff in your care? Again, it's because it engages the higher portions of your brain. It keeps your brain out of the the first thing that your brain does when it's in stress is it goes the amygdala, that lower region, the limbic system, the lower subconscious region of the brain. It kicks in and it takes over. Right? And when that happens, it literally sucks the oxygen out of your out of the thinking, out of your cerebrum. So you're moving now on emotion and on action. You're moving your everything coming out of your mouth, every physical action you're doing. It's all based on that stress response. So when you take that control back over, when you've trained your brain to be able to snap into the present with just a breath, now you're controlling the emotion instead of allowing the emotion to control you. Because if you get five emotional people in a room, it's a problem. <laughs> yeah. So I was just going to say that. I was just going to say, Julie, talk about the effects of, as, you're, as the leader, the effects of your emotions on your team. And how does that affect the culture in your program? So talk a little bit about that in your experience. Yeah, it totally, it it calms, it will calm the entire situation. It literally will shift the energy in the room. Like we've all had that experience and I'm not trying to get it metaphysical, but our we are energetic beings. Our brain fires on electrical impulses. Mm -hmm. Our heart beats based on an electrical impulse, right? So we respond to energy. And I, everyone has had that experience where they've walked into a room and they can feel it. Yeah. And it, I don't know. I just walked into. Yeah. They're like, oh, it's, hmm? yeah. And they're like, I got to get out of this place. It's just like, it's like the air is so thick. So when you are the leader, the individuals in the room with you, the individuals in the job with you, they expect you to lead. That's your position. That's what they look to you as. So when you come in with that calm, you are controlling the energy in the room mm -hmm. and you are bringing it down. And when you were, we were speaking before we went live about the emotional intelligence piece. So when you combine those two and you use that higher thinking, then you are you are controlling and bringing everything down and they're going to mirror you. The brain actually has mirror neurons in it. Right. This is why if I yawn, you probably yawn or vice versa. Right. Or if I smile to you. Yeah. <laughs> If I smile at you, you're going to smile back. It's because our brain has mirror neurons that give us the ability to be empathetic and to connect with human beings. So when you are the one in charge and you exhibit that calm behavior, their brains are literally going to start to mirror yours. I've seen that. I've seen it live. And I've seen, I've seen both sides. I've seen somebody who's come in and can calm the place very quickly. And I've seen someone who can walk in a building and within 20 minutes, everybody is, like you said, is it walking in peace suit, right? So we talked about the importance. Can you please help us, to our listeners out there, give us some effective strategies 
that we can use to incorporate mindfulness in our in our day to day lives. So as individuals, because we can talk about how you do with teams later, but as individuals, I always tell people, it, literally, your brain is in the most impressionable state in between sleep and alpha waves, right? In between sleep and wide awake. And it's called the theta, right? It's this theta field. And it's when your brain is the most impressionable to outside input. That is one of the reasons why I tell people do not touch your phone for the first 20 to 30 minutes of the day. Even, I mean, buy, if you're using it as an alarm, buy a stinking alarm somewhere else. You can get them for two bucks, right? Yeah. At the dollar store. Because what happens is the second you look at it and you see those, uh, Oh, those the call out. Oh, Every exactly. nurse around here is living this day to day nightmare. Yeah, exactly. when well, your phone is pinging at three in the morning, waking you up from sleep because someone's calling out. Turn it. Turn the notifications off. Yeah. Right. If the world and I always tell people, unless you are an ER physician that is on call, correct. The world is nobody is going to die yeah. if you don't answer your phone for the first thirty minutes. So you take that time instead to leisurely allow your brain and your body to come to that higher waking position. You get your coffee, you get your tea, uh, you you sit and you relax and you do your mindfulness practice right then and there. First thing out the gate. Yeah. Now, if you have kids and you're trying to rush them off to school and you're like, my mornings are always way up earlier. Exactly. 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Get up 15 minutes earlier. Give yourself the best gift you can give yourself. Yeah. And get up 15 minutes earlier. Yeah, I remember um, speaking with uh, one of my friends who's a counselor, and her name is Jen. And she said to me, you know, Erica, your biggest problem, you're so incredible. She goes, but your biggest problem is you just don't know how to just be. She's like, just be. Stop. And, I, you know, that's really impactful. She said that to me a really long time ago, and it didn't really, I didn't really get it until I went away. <laughs> uh, you know, but, uh, yeah, like, I was like, wow, this is what she meant. Because I had never really unplugged mm -hmm. the way I unplugged a few months ago, um, and 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 I re highly recommend it. So you said team. So talk about teams. How can you practice mindfulness with your team? Some strategies there. Yeah. So the the first key is to you know give them a good example to follow. Right. Give them. Talk about it. Share your experiences. Share the calmness that it gives you. Share the clarity that it gives you. Because I might get interject to back up just a minute is that you bookend your day that way. So you wake up, but you also have at the evening when your brain is winding down, it slides back through that very impressionable point. So that's when you do five to 10 minutes in the evening and you just do that same walk through become your body how you feel the temperature all that kind of stuff and then you just that's when gratitude is so important you always want to end your day in a positive mind so you always want that last thing that you're really thinking about to be positive and the best way to do that is to reflect on your top three great things that you had or experienced during the day. Because if you go to bed stressed out over what you got to do tomorrow, you're going to wake up stressed out. Yeah. You know, <laughs> right. God, you just gave me an aha moment as well. <laughs> so, you know, as directors or owners, we typically get like nothing. I don't want to say nothing about complaints, but typically it's, oh, I, I need this or that or whatever. Right. But an aha moment when you just said ending your day positively at the end of the day, before you leave, maybe you visit each classroom and you ask the teacher, tell me one good thing that happened today. Tell me one good thing, right? Because you can't be every day. It can't be negative, negative. Right? Tell me one good thing, right? She was on a phone. She did this, this one, that, did it. Tell me one good thing that happened in the classroom today. One kid who hit a milestone. One coworker who helped you without asking. One, you know, admin that gave you an extra 15 minutes because they recognize without you asking, you needed a little extra support, right? Tell me one good thing, right? And if you go around and collect that, that's how you're leaving your building, right? With all of that, as you said, yeah. positive stuff, right? Because we don't tend to do that. We tend to go to our desk at the end. Well, I'm going to speak for myself and I've been doing it a long time, so I'm probably not alone. The end of the day when everybody leaves is when I sit at my desk and go, well, and then I'm making my list of what's to do tomorrow, what fires you got to put out and, you know, who's going to has, you know, their day off requests. And now you've got to figure out how you're going to fill that. And 
you know, the 14 subs you have on the list are not available. So yeah, that was an aha moment. So thank you for sharing that, Julie, because I never thought of doing that, but I'm going to do that tomorrow. And just like, yeah, can y'all tell me one good thing to have yeah. today? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And that that leads perfectly into the last question then that you asked is how can leaders do this with their teams, right? How can they? So when you, again, you're setting the example. So when you as the leader do this at the end of every day, you are forcing those teachers to think about it. You are forcing those teachers to become consciously aware of the positive instead of stressed out over the negative. So it becomes almost a teaching moment that they don't even realize they're having. Yeah. Right. And, and that and that's beautiful. And you can even then take it one step further by saying, OK, we're going to implement mindfulness practice during the day. And this is excellent for the children, too. It is so like the, the kids. Um, Goldie Hawn, who everybody knows, the actress yeah. Goldie Hawn, she has a wonderful institute that she has started, and that's bringing mindfulness meditation into schools. That's what her foundation does. And she has a lot of lot of data on how positive that is. So you can actually teach your teachers how to implement this in the classroom and say, OK, we're going to do one minute. And you have to start off very slow. And obviously, depending on the age of the children, maybe if, if it's the younger children, maybe it's when they're taking their little nappy time or whatever, or they're laying down in their rest time, that that's when the teacher, instead of going, OK, everything's quiet, I'm going to do some paperwork. Uh uh-uh, uh uh-uh. That's when the teacher goes, OK. I'm going to do my mindfulness for a couple minutes, right? And do that because then that allows their brain to reset and recharge the same. Yeah. Right. So you can actually incorporate it into the day-to-day activity. Yeah. And I would say, uh, you know, another place that you could do that is during your uh, gross motor activity, right? A lot of, a lot of teachers do yoga with their children. So that's a great place where you can add a little bit more, right? At talking about what mindfulness is, talking about being grateful, you know, even talking with the kids about what they're grateful for. How I'm grateful my mom made me a sandwich today. Like talking to children about being grateful and talking about being aware of our surroundings. And, you know, we live in New England here and um, the birds, you know, it's spring here. I love, and it's so funny, I come out now at my house and I hear the birds chirping and I always stop and I smile. It brings the smile, like the littlest joy, but it brings a smile to my face like, Oh, it's going to be a beautiful day. You know, we don't get a lot of sunshine and birds chirping what well, we do, but not for a long period of time. So when it happens, it's like, oh, you know, we just yeah. be happy yeah. about it. Stay with us. We'll be right back. And so used to having everything in front of them right away that we forget that innovation just takes time. I, I myself, I get frustrated too. Why? And you know, this is being one of my best friends is, Hey, I talk to you all the time. Hey, man, I'm frustrated in the fact that I can't seem to just get there in Mm -hmm. the next day. But that's just not how these things work. Right. Innovation needs to be planned out. It needs to be very methodical. And then when it finally hits, that's when it seems like to everyone else that it, it sort of just came out of nowhere. But to you, you know, the amount of dedication that it took over that time. So they actually just released they actually just released a, a really good study on um and I, I is it I think it's the National Institute on Brain Science or Neuroscience or whatever that they just released a, a new study that showed even more benefits of nature, just listening to nature sounds, forest sounds, water mm. and birds. Yeah. Listening to that actually increases your cognitive ability and your cognitive functioning. Oh. So that's one of the reasons why you love it so much. That makes sense. And so my teacher brain went, right, is when you are doing other types of activities, maybe when you have centers open or you can play that in the background, you know, at a level that doesn't disrupt what you're going on. But again, if it helps stimulate the the neurons in the brain, as you said there, um, it stimulates your brain activity. What a great way to combine that with what you're what you're using. We have these really cool stuffed animals that we bought at Ace Hardware, of all places, um, which I don't know why they had them, but they had these stuffed animals that were birds. And they had all different kinds of birds. And when you squeeze the middle, it made the chirp. It was from the Audubon Society. It made the sound of the bird. And we must add a basket of like 35 of them. And the kids all started to recognize the different bird calls. Um, but they really did enjoy it. When I, They would always ask me to bring that basket out at circle time. So 
you know, the children are just also equally, you know, gravitate towards nature. So we talked about the importance. We talked about some strategies. Let's talk about what are some potential challenges or barriers that early childhood leaders may face when implementing mindfulness practices and how can they overcome them? Well, I think the the first one is the pushback, right? It's the, there's, for one thing, because there's been so much misunderstanding over the years of just what mindfulness meditation is, and it's always had this woo-woo, for lack of a better term, label put on it. There wasn't a good understanding. And that's one of the reasons why I love of the impact of it, not a good understanding of the how powerful it is. And that's one of the things that I absolutely love about the neuroscience piece, right? Because we can actually look at brains um, functioning, scan the brains functioning in in meditative states and in doing mindfulness meditation. It's fascinating. But so some of those challenges are that pushback, the pushback that the leaders them or that the teachers themselves may have, right? The teacher may say, oh, I don't want to do this one more thing to add to my list, right? One more thing. Uh, <clears throat> so education is the is is always the first thing, right? Uh, being able to, you know, teachers are smart. So if the leaders are, are giving them a report and saying, hey, you know, here's Here's a report. Here's a latest finding. Uh, here's here's what Society on Neuroscience said, or here's what right. So that so that they can actually go. Okay, there is some validity here. It's not uh, you know it's not that woo woo. And it's the same thing in dealing with the parents. You know, if parents give the teachers yeah, push back, you know, it's also a great resource for the parents too because parenting is is hard, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then with the kids, it's it's gonna it just takes. Kids will follow in time, right? They just, they have to learn it. Yeah. Practice. And so if they're getting, yeah, practice. If they're getting a little bit of pushback, then you're just starting with 30 seconds and you're bumping that to a minute and you're bumping that to 90 seconds. You can't, you keep your expectations realistic. You know, you're saying, well, I can't make this, you know, ADD child sit for, for, you know, three minutes, much less, you know, or for yeah. one minute, much less three or five minutes. It, it, it takes patience on the adult's part to be able to just implement it slowly, and then it becomes a habit. Then it becomes a regular routine. And the kids wind up really, really enjoying it. Yeah, and that's the, that, those are probably the children who need it most to figure out how to have that impulse control and how to pull it together when they feel like it's kind of all unraveling. Julie, this is always a fascinating conversation when we get together. I can't believe we're almost at the end of time. So, um, yeah, I know it goes so fast. I knew it was going to. I'll, you know, as I said, you know, it's always so wonderful to talk to you. Um, I would say we've got maybe another three three minutes. So, would you like to share any success as success stories or examples of how mindfulness and leadership has positively impacted someone you work with, or or one of your clients, or yourself? Yeah. You know what? I'll share one that I just had today in okay. dealing with a client. Um, the aha moments that she had of one, the importance and the difference that it makes in the self-care. We don't think of mindfulness under self-care, right? We think of it, we, we don't look at it that way. We look at it at as this, you know, almost like an exercise, like, okay, it's the same as doing an elliptical or whatever. But just the aha moment and the re, the um, weight off her shoulders when she started to do it, when she learned how to do it, right? The success that that has given just within her, her personal range. And then there's when I was reading a study and when I was doing the neuroscience of leadership course a few years back, where the most successful leaders that have become the most financially successful leaders are leaders that implement on a daily basis that twice a day, morning and evening mindfulness practice. So Amen. yeah, so it's it's tangible. It's financially tangible. It's physically tangible. The changes in your body, um, it, it works. It's powerful. Again, I believe that. So thank you so much. So I want to wrap up just a couple of things. Um, one, um, here's my ahas in our, in our 22 minutes, um, staff newsletters. So if, if you don't feel like your folks are going to read a report, you can intertwine that information into your staff newsletters, right? You want to make this part of your culture, right? You have to take care of yourself before your team is going, because they're going to follow you. Cause if you're a leader, right, it's not really a title. If you're a leader, then lead, lead your team to take care of themselves and take care of the children in your care. Um, I think another place that you could do is when you're putting together your staff evaluations, 
maybe make that also part of a priority, right? Where you want to do all the check boxes and did you do this? Did you do that? Did you keep your shelves clean? Did you take care of yourself? Did you make sure that you were doing mindfulness and that your stress level was down and that you were engaging with the children in a way that was positive and nurturing? Um, you know, so I think there's a place that you could add it. Um, again, as Julie said, you know, leading by example and adding nature to your classroom, both your inside classroom, outside classroom, right? Get out as much as you can. Children love nature. It helps with the brain. Um, so I love Julie. We'll probably have her on our show again. Let us know how you love Julie as well. Uh, you can catch her on her own podcast, Women Excelling Everywhere. Do you have more than one podcast or is that the podcast? If I-, I do. I have a second one called Brain Lady Speaks. So Women Excelling Everywhere, more specifically Women okay. Issues, Brain Lady Speaks, the general neuroscience, neuropsychology. Perfect. We are going to put Julie's links down below. So if you want to check out her podcast, um, I highly recommend it. She's a wonderful lady and certainly knows what she's talking about. Um, for those of you who are tuned in today, we appreciate you so much again. Um, if you'd like to support our channel, we really, really appreciate it. We want to keep bringing the best of the best to you. Um, and we're working really hard to do that. We're also getting out to conferences throughout the country, which is so exciting. I'm very passionate about it. I want to meet all of you. Um, we are going to the Born to Teach conference in uh, in July, the beginning of July, the week of 4th of July in Texas. Um, so if you are a Texas listener, be sure to go to that conference. And if you do, stop by the Child Care Director's Chair booth. If you've never been on our YouTube channel, please visit our YouTube channel. If you love the content, subscribe. If you don't love the content, let me know. Inbox me. I promise I'll answer. So that's it for today's episode of Child Care Director Share. I'm your host, Erica Scoscio. As always, thank you for tuning in. Bye. Have a great day. Well, all the cute little kiddos have been picked up and it's time to go home. And that'll do it for another episode of the Child Care Director's Chair. Please leave a review so Erica knows the information is helping you to manage and improve your child care centers. Remember to subscribe to get the latest episode from Erica's Child Care Director's Chair. <laughs>